domination. So William went somewhere to impress, overall, and subdue the people of London. Chose the site just inside the eastern city wall, where once an old drummer fort had stood. So right here, in the year 1078, is to authorise the building of his first royal palace and fortress in England. Today, we refer to that fortress as the White Tower. And it's situated behind the wall over there. But what are you all looking at because it's behind the wall? Listen to the words! <laughs> Don't worry though, I'll show you it when we're inside the fortress. Over the next 200 years, successive monarchs continue to add to their defences. The inner ballium, or defensive wall, containing 13, you'll need this number later, 13 smaller towers, was completed in 1220. This outer wall, was completed in 1280, has six further towers, all along the south to guard against the attack coming from the river. Third line defence is the motor ditch, once filled with water, goes all the way around the tower, you can see it behind me and behind you. The moat was dug during the reign of King Edward I, who brought in an expert, a master Walter, from Holland. It is 120 feet wide, but fully excavated 15 feet deeper than you can see it today. It was designed to use the tidal flow of the River Thames. So twice a day, the river will flow into it and around it and clean it out. And that system worked really, really well for about a week. <laughs> then we discovered the Dutch had dug our moat slightly too shallow. So all the rubbish and excrement that came into it from Shoreditch and Houndsditch became too much. They silted up and became the largest cesspit in the city of London. A source of pestilence, especially to the 1,000 soldiers who lived here as the tower garrison. Now, English workmanship being as speedy as ever, we only had to make do with the largest cesspit in the city of London for a mere 500 years. So in 1843, the Cusper of the Tower of the Duke of Wellington asked permission from Queen Victoria to drain the moat. The Queen, the Queen gave her permission and the Duke had to fill it with sand and oyster shells to the heights you see it today. They put it to good use as the exercise area and parade ground for the troops of the garrison. As I said, this is the first royal palace and fortress of its kind built anywhere in this country. Over the years, it's been used for many, many things. The White Tower, which is still behind that wall, which you still can't see yet, was our royal residence until 1603. Our last king to actually live here being King James I. The crown jewels and royal regalia have been stored here since the year 1303. Royal mint located behind the walls where all the coins of the realm were designed and produced. It was the site of the first royal observatory where we studied stars and planets that moved away to Greenwich in the 17th century. It was an armory for the storage of warlike stores and provisions. All official records and papers of every king's and queen's court were stored here. To the middle of the 19th century, they moved away to Kew to form the public records office. What's the Royal Menagerie or Zoo, where animals like lions, tigers and bears given to the kings and queens as gifts were kept until 1835. They moved to a small research facility in Regent's Park. Then that research facility became known as... Well done. And last, but no, by no means least, this is the most famous prison complex anywhere in the world. Now, do I have any of my American cousins present? Apparently, across that water, there is a very small, insignificant place known as, hold on, Alka-Seltzer, no, Al no, Alcatraz, yes, yes, we've all heard of it, we know it's a prison, but this is the most famous prison complex anywhere in the world, I'm glad we sorted that out. Tell your prisoners, if you turn around, look up onto the hill, just see the top of that tall white building there, all those amazing sculptures inside it, see it? That building right there is of enormous historical and architectural importance, not only to the city of London, but actually to the entire United Kingdom. So that building you're looking at right there has absolutely nothing to do with the Tower of London. I just really like it, it's beautiful, look, it's gorgeous. <laughs> that used to be the Port of London Authority, it's now a seven star luxury hotel. However, serves as a landmark for me to tell you about the park in front of there that has a lot to do with the tower. That park just at the top there where the buses go past is called Trinity Square Gardens. Stands in an area known as Tower Hill. That was the point of public execution between the 14th and 18th centuries. Over the years, no less than 125 men lost their heads up there by means of block and axe. Yeah. Our first victim was Simon Sudbury. The Archbishop of Canterbury was murdered at the hands of peasants in 1381 for daring to introduce the poll tax. Seven years later, 1388, the first legal execution on Tower Hill, that of Sir Simon Burley. And by coincidence, or maybe 
Jessica's don't like people called Simon. Our last victim in 1747 was another Simon, Simon Fraser, the Lord Lovett, an 80-year-old Scottish Lord who supported both the first and second Jacobite rebellions. Just for a moment, let's pause and imagine the scene up there on the day of execution. Thousands would gather around the raised platform and scaffold to witness the proceedings. And delivered his final speech to said his prayers, the prisoner kneels down, places his neck upon a block of oak. He would then give a word or signal. The executioner would. Because I'm so hoping he has his victim in one stroke. The executioner picks up the severed and still bleeding head. Holds it aloft for all to see. Turns to the seven crowd and proclaims, Behold, the head of a traitor. So die, all traitors, God save the king. Excuse me, can you all hear me? Can we have a cheer, please? Hey! See? They can hear me! <laughs> now, it's the first time today he's lost his head for me, so he's feeling okay about it. So he, hold on. So he says we can try again. <laughs> Behold, wait for it, the head of a traitor. So die! All traitors can't save the king! Hey! Not bad, not bad. Right, the head being purred by a soldier's pike. Came through the streets of London towards London Bridge. In those days, the only crossing across the River Thames. The head be displayed with the entrance to the city as the sign of the fate that would await all would be traitors. Meanwhile, headless courts be taken down, placed into a small cart, brought back into the tower, and quickly buried in an unmarked traitor's grave in the Chapel Royal. Like the headless corpse, as we turn our attention to the tower itself. When you arrive, a lot of you came down the walkway past our ticket office. In the middle of that busy walkway, where stood the bulwark gates, where all prisoners due for execution were handed over to the Sheriff of London. You then came down a narrow walkway around the side there, where you may have noticed, some of you, the ruins of the Lion Tower. Did you see it? This is where I'd like to point out. Here at the Tower of London, we never have been, never will be, original at naming anything. It was a tower. We kept lions in it, so of course it's called the Lion Tower. You then Came through the archway of the middle tower, so named it once stood in the middle of the moat. <laughs> Make it worse, trust me. Even then, though, I had to cross this drawbridge before it could enter. So, right there is the Bywood Tower. Now, I am going to lead you, which by the way means I go in front through that archway in a moment. As we do, we'd like to look up, we notice the spikes of the portcullis or Norman drop gate. Weighs one and a half tons and dates back to 1326. Now, unfortunately, the rope that holds that drop gate up also dates back to 1326, so be quick, go through my arch. You may also notice three circular holes drilled in the stonework above your heads. They're called murder holes. They're used by defence of that tower to pour boiling oil and hot sand onto any attackers as they try to get in. Now, I've asked you to be quick, go through my arch, but I know I've wasted my breath because every one of you will stop, look up, dive into a murder hole. Before you do that though, you need to know the third use of the murder hole. It's the toilet. If you wish to stay into the toilet, you feel free. Me, I go straight through the arch. Now, I walk really quickly, keep up. 